pleased that Ireland was on his, um, on his list. Um, he's a distinguished expert, author and academic whose expertise includes poverty reduction, inequality, inclusive growth and the 2030 Agenda. He's worked as an advisor to the Government of Bangladesh as well as to several international organisations and prior to taking up his present position he was director of the Poverty Division of the UNDP. Um, when Dr Jahan was here last uh, we were still in the process of facilitating the SDGs. Ireland and Kenya were working on that together. And now we're 18 months out from the finalization of that time. And m the international system, countries and multilateral organizations are working towards mainstreaming the achievement of the SDGs into national and international development planning. And in working towards the global international or the global implementation of the SDGs and responding to inequalities, discrimination and exclusion, Ireland places a very high value on our partnership with the UNDP. The UNDP is Ireland's largest UN partner in terms of core funding. We've provided 50 million in core support since 2012, which allows the agency to plan and respond to the most important needs. We also work with UNDP on specific programs and particularly in fragile states. In 2015 and 16, the average amount of funding in total to and through the UNDP was about 14 million a year. Um, resources such as the Human Development Report will play an important role in continuing to place people at the centre of the policy debate on sustainable development. And the 25th edition this year is de devoted to human development for everyone, on which Dr Jahan will speak, echoing the theme of the SDGs that no one will be left behind. Great progress has been made since 1990 when the report was first developed. Ireland, for instance, has moved into the highest category of human development. Um, but there's an awful lot still to be done. The STD targets show that, and particularly to reduce poverty, increase engagement by those most excluded, and reduce inequalities. So I hope that Dr. Jahan, through his talk, will help us consider the targets that we face, how to measure the effectiveness of the work that aims to achieve them, and what needs to be done differently to make sure that all groups are reached. And so I look forward to hearing from Dr. Jahan on human development for everyone and to hearing of the opportunities and challenges that lie ahead. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Uh, I think um, three observations are in order. Uh, first, that I have nothing to do with the bus strike that is going on, <laughs> uh, but I brought sunshine, uh, so I want to make that uh, reference. Um, uh, second, uh, I have been here in this very room uh, two years ago on 13th of April 2015, so it's always good to be back um, to talk to you uh, at this beautiful place of IIEA. And third, uh, we are small in numbers, but that doesn't matter. Quality matters, not necessarily quantity. So I'm pretty sure that we will have uh, a very qualitative interactive dialogue in this room on the 2016 Human Development Report. Let me start with a very simple statement uh, every human being counts, and every human life is equally valuable. That universal principle is at the core of the human development approach and has been the driving force for the 2016 Human Development Report. Upholding that principle and resonating the 2030 Development Agenda, the 2016 Human Development Report asserts that in the human development journey, no one should be left behind. Human development is not for the few, not even for the most, but for everyone. The 2016 Human Development Report comes up with five basic messages. First, over the past 25 years, significant progress have been made on many fronts of human development, but still deep deprivations persist. Boats have been lifted, but not to the same extent, and not all boats. Second, in every society, there are specific groups which face systemic discrimination and deprivations. It is critical to identify the who, where, and why of those deprivations and discriminations. Third, 
Mapping of deprivations is critical, but it is not enough. Human development for everyone also requires that we have to revisit some of the analytical issues of the framework, as well as the assessment perspectives that we have. Fourth, national policies for human development for everyone exist, and we have to bring them together in a very coherent way, supported by actions at the global level. And finally, the Human Development Framework and the 2030 Development Agenda are mutually reinforcing, and they inform and influence each other. Building on these five messages, doing a lot of analysis, and drawing different sets of data, the report presents five major findings. One, along with progress, significant deprivations still exist in the world. On the progress side, since 1990, every day, 136,000 people have escaped poverty. And more than two billion people have been lifted out of low human development. Child mortality has been halved, and 2.6 billion people now have access to safe water. But on the other side of the balance sheet, there are deprivations which are lingering, like poverty, deprivations which are deepening, like inequalities, and deprivations which are emerging, like climate change. One in every three people are still in low human development. And 1.5 billion people still face multidimensional poverty. Every minute, 11 children under five are dying. Every hour, we are losing 35 mothers while giving birth to a child. Inequalities have become a defining issue of our time. Eight billion years in the world own as much wealth as the bottom 50% of humanity. And that implies one billionaire is worth 462 million people. Air pollution kills six million people <coughs> every year and 38 million lives are lost due to non-communicable diseases. If we do not address the issue of climate change right now, by 2030, there will be an additional 100 million people in extreme poverty. The second finding of the report is that there are specific groups in every society who face systemic and systematic deprivations. These groups are, among others, women and girls, indigenous peoples, ethnic minorities, persons with disabilities, LGBTI community, migrants and refugees, and so on. And these are the people who face discrimination and deprivation on a daily basis. 370 million indigenous people represent 5% of global population, but account for 15% of global poverty. 65 million people are forcibly displaced from their homes. And that figure is larger than the population of France. Let me now focus for a minute on a particular specific group which face discrimination and deprivations. And that is basically women and girls. Globally, the female labor force participation is 49%, as opposed to 76% for men. Women do most of the agricultural work in the developing world, but they own less than 9% of land. And every year, 15 million girls under 18 are getting married. That means one child bride every two seconds. 
it limits their potentials, it destroys their possibilities, it basically shrinks their capabilities, and it stunts their human development. There are several factors which work in a mutually reinforcing way to deepen this kind of discrimination and deprivation. Some of them are discriminatory laws, some of them social norms and values, some of them are related to exclusion. In 18 countries in the world, women need permission from their husband to work. In the 32 countries, they follow a different procedure to get a passport. Women face life cycle deprivations. And this is the time to try to close the gender gap. If the present trend continues, then East Asia would need 111 years to close just the economic gender gap, and the Arab states 356 years. We have to be mindful of these issues and try to push forward the agenda. Third, along with mapping, it is also important to look at some of the analytical questions in the framework. Often the human development paradigm talks about individual capabilities. That's fine. But at the same time, it is important to talk about collective capabilities. Because people who are disadvantaged cannot move further through their own individual efforts. They would need collective support. Similarly, human development often talks about the well-being freedom, being nourished, living a long and healthy life, having a decent standard of living, and so on. But it is equally important to talk about the agency freedom, the whole issue of voice and autonomy. Because people who are marginalized would need that kind of voice and autonomy so that they can influence the things that shape their lives. On the issue of assessment and measurement, let me just make three points. One is we need a disaggregated framework so that we can have a better understanding of the society in which we live, in, live on. For too many years, we have been subjected or we have been held hostages to the tyranny of the averages. <clears throat> and I think it is time to end that. Second, the quality of human development is as important as its quantity. Yes, more children are enrolled in school. There's no doubt that more children are attending classes. But one vital question is, what are they learning? And third, there are new sources of data, big data, real-time data, open data, and the human development assessment and measurement should take advantage of these things in a constructive way so that we can better present the reality of the world. Fourth, the report presents a four-pronged national policy matrix. First, there have to be universal policies in terms of inclusive growth, employment generation, financial inclusion, investment in women and girls, making expenditures human priority friendly. Second, there have to be specific measures for people with special needs. For example, affirmative action or setting some quota as and when necessary. Third, human development will never be sustained or sustainable if it is not resilient. That means addressing the issue of climate change, trying to deal with global epidemics like Ebola and Zika, which we have seen in the recent past. At the same time, trying to deal with the HIV AIDS issue, and finally, addressing the issues of conflict all around the world. The fourth and the final part of the matrix is people will have to be empowered through protecting their human rights by ensuring access to justice and also ensuring transparency and accountability of the system in which they live. 
all these national policies would have to be complemented by actions at the global level. And those would include, among others, a stable global macroeconomic framework, an equitable trading system, a fairer framework of migration, changes and reforms in the multilateral organization in terms of funding, in terms of representation, in terms of voice, and also ensuring a vibrant global civil society. The fourth finding is that further advances are possible. Changes do take place. Transformations are not far away. People are raising their voices. There's an increasing awareness on environmental sustainability and climate change. Things which were once taboos are now being discussed more freely, more openly in various societies and fora. We have to build on those things. Last but not the least, steadily but surely, there is a global consensus emerging on many global issues. Just think of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Once it was unthinkable, now it is unstoppable. Finally, in conclusion, human development for everyone is not a dream. It is a reality. We have to build on what we have achieved. We have to overcome the challenges and explore possibilities. And we have to attain what was deemed unattainable. Hopes are within our reach to realize. So let us start a journey from deprivations to prosperity, from despair to hope, from challenges to opportunities. And in that journey, let us also focus first on those who are farthest behind. And if we do that, then at the end of the journey, when we we'll reach our goal, we'll see that we have done it together. And when we look back, we shall find that no one has been left behind. Thank you very much. <laughs>